Okay, good morning everyone. My name is Matt Terry and I work primarily in behavioural safety. I have been doing so for the last sort of two years coming from a traditional safety background. Uh, the reason why I came out of the safety background and went into behavioural safety is because I wanted to make a real difference when people come into my sessions. Um, I'm here today to, to introduce to you Jason Anker's DVD on working at height, which is the implications of actually a person coming off a ladder from 10 foot and spending the last 18 years in, in, in a wheelchair. So all these companies are doing some fantastic, uh, some fantastic resources out there, some fantastic studies, and there's a lot of information out there. But for me, is if we get safety and we understand it and there's so much information out there, why are people still taking the chances and why are people still having accidents? And in all the study that I've done, in all of the sessions that I'm doing up and down the country weekly, primarily with operatives, they ask the question, how are you actually working when you're on your own? So for me, behavior and how people work is the measure of when you're doing things on your own. And the only way of you actually analyzing your own relationship to safety is how do you do stuff at home when no one's watching? Do you really believe in safety or work in a height in what we're all related to here? And when you are last up a ladder or doing something slightly dodgy at home, how are we actually doing it? The example that we always use is what do you wear on your feet when you're mowing the lawn? Do you wear safety glasses of some sort of type when you're strimming the grass when you finish mowing the lawn? Or is it just something that you think of whilst you're doing and you say, well, it'll never happen to me anyway? So what I'm always saying to people is, how do you change your habits? Because the behavior is just down to the habit of the way you've learned how to work. The only way to change your habit is to put a pair of safety shoes on top of your lawnmower at home so you have to consciously look at it when you go in next time. You could be having a Sunday lunch on, done my potatoes, I've got all my veg ready. You're walking around and then all of a sudden you think, right, I'm going to mow the lawn now. And you're thinking about everything else until you get conscious to making a decision. Do I actually put them on or do I take the shoes off and put them somewhere else and carry on in my flip-flops or trainers? Same with your strimmer, etc. How do you access your loft at home? Have you got a proper loft ladder? Or do you use a step ladder or even worse? So before we start trying to change everybody else's way of working, because everyone else is wrong, we have to basically assess where we are with our own safety to get the correct message across. What I'm going to do now is show you a, um, a DVD that was put together by myself, Outtakes, and Jason Anker. And um, hopefully when you look at this, you can reflect on the different side of all the good work that we're doing, but the downside of having an accident. Now, we've all heard of accidents before, but we haven't actually heard of what happens after and what happens in the, in the, in the 18 years after the coincidence of accident. So. I'm Jason Anker. In January 1993, when I was 24 years old, I went to help my father-in-law on a roofing job. I wasn't a roof by trade, but work and money were scarce and I had a young family to support. At the end of the day we were called over to fix a leaky roof. I noticed the ladder wasn't tied on, but I said nothing. If I had, I wouldn't have spent every day since in a wheelchair. I've worked in spinal cord injury for over 25 years now and um, the hardest part of doing it is actually having that conversation with what are commonly young people and, and very often young men uh, and uh, there is absolutely no doubt that what happens to them changes their life completely and changes the life of everyone around them. And I can remember a nurse, she came over to me and she sort of said, calm down, you're not doing anybody any favours by shouting. And I said, calm down, now I can't feel my fucking legs. And the doctor's called, and he brings along with him one of these. A bag. A bag of piss. And I have to wear one of these every day. I've got one of these on, on my leg all the time. And I hate it. What aspects of the change that occurs with paralysis do people find the most difficult to, to deal with? If you ask someone who was paralysed and in a wheelchair for a couple of years, they would almost invariably say that 
they didn't really care too much about the walking side of things, but they would wish to have their bladder and bowel control back and to have sexual functions. We are just normal, ordinary family. And trust me, it can happen to anybody. And it does, every day. The main reason I didn't speak up, the simple fact is I didn't think it was going to happen to me. Stop and think before you do anything. You know, everything's got to be done safe, safely. You only get one chance. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, the ramp, it was the only place we could get the ramp, so I've had to come in and actually ask somebody to move. But these are the challenges I'm faced with every day. You know, toilets aren't accessible. Everything I do in my life now is a compromise. And my accident was in 1993, and it's took me, been doing these speeches, these talks, for about 18 months. Never thought I'd be doing this in a million years. Um, met Matt, and he sort of suggested to me that I come out and start talking to industry about my accident. And I didn't get it. And the next time he spoke to me to see where I was, I was actually in Tenerife. And I said to him, there is no way I'm coming out, sitting in front of people, talking about my accident. And... He persuaded me to come along to some of his sessions, and I still didn't get it. I hate it. Why are people interested in my story? And we was doing a job at King's Cross, and there was some young guy at the front playing with his mobile phone, not even listening. And I never even talked about the personal stuff I did. I used to just talk about an accident. And from that moment, I got it. Because, A, it's not about an accident. My accident's happened. It could have been anything. So my story's changed from being an accident to talking about living in a wheelchair for the last 18 years. And I get the point that it's not about me. This is about me talking and the people I'm talking to imagining that this had happened to them. Um, seeing my dad cry, I mean, I talked about this before the DVD came out. My dad would cry if I told him I got a punch in my wheelchair. And this is after 18 years, not, you know, not 18 months. My mum comes across quite well on the DVD, but my mum still sees a counsellor and she still takes antidepressants. Again, not 18 months after my accident, 18 years. And the only thing that I've done well to make my mum and dad move on with their life is doing what I do now. They finally moved on with their life a little bit. But I've destroyed my life. But at the end of the day, I did something at work which I knew was wrong. And the whole reason I took that choice and the whole reason the majority of people take choices like that is they simply believe it's not going to happen to them. And I just try and do my talks and just say to him, but what if it did? Um, you can see how my accident has destroyed my mum and dad's life. It has devastated my life. Every day I live and it's compromised. Some of the things I can't do anymore, like play football with my friends, has devastated me. But I think what's devastated me more and what's the hardest thing to sort of live with is the devastation I've caused to my family and my friends. Um, you can see by mum's dad's reaction, and my sister comes on DVD. My brother still finds it difficult to be around me. And it's not that he's embarrassed of me being in a wheelchair. I haven't coped with this for the best part of 16 years. And he couldn't deal with the fact all the stuff I was doing to myself, he couldn't be around me because it upset him too much. My friends, especially my football friends, still find it difficult to be around me because initially they don't do 
things because I've just had my accident. But if you can imagine, over the subsequent years, they still want to do the things that I can't do anymore. And because they feel guilty of doing the things like playing football and going on holidays and going to theme parks, they find it easier not to be around me. But at the end of the day, it is not their fault. This was my fault. I did this to my friends. But I think the biggest, the biggest thing that's hurt me is what I've done to my children. Um, I mean, my accident has cost me so much. But well, if you can imagine sitting on a patio with my mum, lovely summer's day, and watching my dad kick a football around the garden with my son, and suddenly coming away that I was never going to kick a football with my boy. And I went in the house and I sobbed. And this was five years after my accident. Um, I think another bad moment in my life was, um, do you know, like when you've been learning to ride a bike and you've had the stabilizers on, and it comes to the big day, and you've taken the stabilizers off, and you hold on to the bike seat, and you make them a promise. And you promise them faithfully that you're not going to let go. But as they sort of get riding down the path, you sort of let go of the bike seat. And it only happens once. Do you know that moment when they sort of get 20 feet, 20 feet down the path, and they put their foot down for the first time. And then they look back up the path, and they've suddenly realized they've rode a bike for the first time. I knew sort of well up inside of how proud it makes you feel. At the end of the day, I had to sit and watch my dad do that. And that absolutely destroyed me. But as my life's gone on, I'm gradually getting on with my life, and you think life's sort of turned a corner. You know, my daughter's now 21, and she lives with a boyfriend. And, you know, one day my daughter's going to get married. And through a choice I made at work by doing something I knew that was wrong, through that decision, you know, how am I going to walk my daughter up the aisle? Um, especially when I go into industry and we talk about all the safety things and the safety rules, and the lads get it. And it is a simple choice. Do you do safety because you have to or you choose to? Because if the lads are only doing safety when they choose to, and they're not clipping on when they're working at height, when them lads are then talking about the football, or a row with the missus, I wasn't looking at you, by the way. <laughs> but you know what I mean, and the lad's not really concentrating. If he's not clipping on through choice every single time, what's going to happen to him when his mind's wandered? Is he then you know, going to suddenly forget that he's clipped on? So this is all about choices. And when we speak and when we present with Matt, it's just getting the guys to understand that when they're doing something, if they don't do it through habit, then they're running a risk that this week they can end up in one of these. Because the average is about 80 to 100 cases a year of spinal injuries, resulting in foursome heights through industry. About two a week. So if you imagine sitting in front of a load of workers and you put the fact that two guys this week somewhere are going to end up in a wheelchair and are they then prepared to run that risk, what do you think their answer is? Um, are there any other questions anybody wants to ask me? My talks normally go on for 45 minutes, but today we've got a few time constraints. So are there any other questions that anyone wants to ask me? Um, I can't believe what I do now, and for the best part of 16 years before I started doing it, I tried to be the person I was before my accident. I didn't get it. And through doing this, um, when Matt initially spoke to me, 
He said you'll be speaking in front of about 10 or 15 people maximum. Uh, I think the most we've done is about 400 in one sitting. And it's just bizarre. I still find it absolutely bizarre. But if I can do this and inspire one person not to have an accident like this, I'm totally happy. Um, I haven't got all the answers. I don't think nobody has. It's just a mixture of everybody believing in what they do. They're doing it for the right reasons. And hopefully we can prevent accidents, especially for some heights. Okay. Um, I've got a slight obsession with trainers to an extent that I must have about 25 pairs lined up in my wardrobe. So my daughter now is quite settled. She never really gives me a problem. But my son's sort of 18. He's not a bad lad, a bit of a rum lad. He doesn't really know what he's doing to himself. And he came to me probably about a year ago. And he said to me, Dad, I need some new trainers. And I simply said to him, look, son, get yourself a job. If you want to buy yourself some load of trainers, it's up to you. And he turned to me and he said, yeah, it's all right for you, Dad. So straight away, I think he's having a bit of a go at me about my obsession with trainers. And I said, look, son, it's simple. I work bloody hard. If I want to spend all my money on trainers, it's up to me. And he said to me, no, Dad, I didn't mean that. Now, since my accident, since I've had my compensation, I've drove rally cars, been up in gliders, micro lighting, parachute jumps, scuba diving, magical experiences I never would have done before my accident. And I've always said there ain't nothing good about being in a wheelchair. But my wise ass 18 year old son is caught with the good thing about being in a wheelchair that I've got no argument to. It's all right, Dad. It's all right for you. Your shoes are always like brand new. So in his wisdom, my 80-year-old son has come up with the only good thing about being in a wheelchair is you get really good value about it, you know, with your shoes. And that is it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's scary. Um, He's coming up next. Yeah, yeah. It does, uh, it does make you function, mate.